around Medinet Mahdi, around the temple here dedicated to Sobek and Renenotet, you'll see on the top of all of the, the sand dunes, it's like topped with, it looks like little, little black caps. But when you look closely, it's actually pottery shards. We have pottery shards like this, and this was brought here for thousands of years. People came here, brought offerings of wine and grain, and they left them here to appease the goddesses and the gods that were worshipped at the temple. So when we look at all of this, just think about the thousands of people that came here wanting to make a connection to the temple and leaving these maybe to make their life a little better. Because the temple and city is so rural, it was supported by the priests and pilgrims coming to make offerings to the gods. The pilgrimage would have led them down the stairs being greeted by ferocious guardians, the avenue of lion sphinxes. If we venture to the museum in Cairo, more of Medinet Mahdi's past can be revealed. For you see, pharaohs spanning thousands of years would have housed a group of special women here, women whose role was to pleasure the pharaoh, the harem of the kings. Specially selected women, sometimes handed down from mother to daughter, lived out in Fayum. These women were always unique and beautiful. They were treated well by the pharaoh, who expected certain entertainment back as gratitude. One pharaoh in particular, is well documented for his visits to the harem in Fayu. This pharaoh built several temples in Fayu, where he planned to further cultivate the oasis. Pharaoh Amunemhat III. He placed several statues of himself at these sacred sites. He even built a pyramid in Fayum, capped with an exquisite pyramidion, made from meteoric stone. These strange-looking sphinxes were made for Amunimhat and placed in Fayum, later adapted for several kings, Ramses, Merenpetah, and Susanes. Amunimhat inherited a peaceful Egypt after his father had conquered Nubia. With a full beard, thick wig, and interesting features, this Fayum statue of Amunimhat shows the pharaoh as a high priest. He developed the Fayum more than any predecessor, creating large canals to nourish the outer oasis. Amunimhat's successor and son died very young, leaving Amunimhat's daughter, Sobek Neferu, to become a female pharaoh. 350 years before the incomparable Hatshepsut. Strolling down the Sphinx Avenue is truly a journey through time, passing numerous lion sphinxes dating from 1800 BC to 200 AD, from Egyptian to Greek and Roman. Beyond the first set of lions, you enter a Ptolemaic period temple from 300 BC, with its many columns and a central altar dedicated to the goddess Isis. Once closed up by limestone bricks, however, this site was not for Isis. This temple is dedicated to Renunet, and she is a snake goddess. Uh, most goddesses are snakes in the hieroglyphs. They, Isis is drawn as a snake, Nephthys is drawn as a snake, Mut is drawn as a snake, and so is Renunet. And in their snake forms, 
they are protectors. Uh, thus, we have so many lions as part of this uh, brigade as we go through to the sanctuary, the temple. There are so many lions uh, and serpents and crocodiles. And these are not um, boogie boogie things. They are, uh, they're meant to be inspiring, protecting, building up one's energy. Further down the avenue, you enter a small secondary temple in undecorated Old Kingdom style, possibly repurposed as a storage for offerings from pilgrims. Further, two recumbent lions guard the entrance to the pylon of the main temple. Upon entering, the god of writing and wisdom, Thoth, is shown. The inner Middle Kingdom relief shows the goddess of the site, Renenutet, suckling a child on her lap, protected by the vulture neckbit with a pharaoh offering to them. Before continuing, two statues of a queen wearing a Greek dress flank the entrance. She is Ptolemaic queen Arsinoe, who had a large following here after her death. Although one can spend hours exploring outside, refuge from the sun can be found inside the Snake Renenutet and Sobek Crocodile Temple. This is the temple here at Medinet Nadi, which is dedicated to Renenutet and Sobek. What's interesting is on the columns, we have the name of Amunemhat III, the father of Sobek Neferu. We have a little cartouche of Sobek Neferu over here, which I'll show to you in a second. But this temple has such a vast history, started in the 12th dynasty by Sobek Neferu and her father. But we have a scene inside here of Ramses II. We see Ramses II in the middle with the god Sobek on the side, the god Anubis on the other side, and they're pouring out these beautiful unk shapes, which are symbolic for water, holy water, purification water. What's even more interesting is drawn onto Ramses. We can see another pharaoh has been drawn in in black charcoal, showing, building a foundation stone. So extending this temple. This temple has such a huge history. We have Tutmosis and Hatshepsut, and this went on all the way into the Roman period. It is absolutely incredible. The expansion of the temple from various kings was to appease Renenutet for a bountiful harvest and Sobek for the continuation of flowing water. Aset takes a moment to read texts from the temple to the group. As many wish to have offspring of children praying to you, they acquire the blessing of children. Persuading the Golden Nile, you lead down an appropriate time upon the land of Egypt as blessing for men. These texts are originally from the reign of Amunemhat. He's shown throughout the small temple offering and receiving from the two patron gods of Fayum. While offering, Amunemhat in turn receives three chained anks from the crocodile-headed god Sobek. At the Cairo Museum, several pristine stela and ostraca from Medinet Mahdi can be found, showing the protector of the Nile, Sobek. A Horus priest from Saqqara during the 19th dynasty 
named Nacht even made offerings to Renenutet, the slender, elegant goddess with her cobra appearance stands behind the patron god of Saqqara, Ptah, ensuring the land shall be fruitful. Back at Medinet Mahdi, carved into the papyrus-styled columns in one of her many forms, Renenutet welcomes the visitor as a full cobra. So here we see the goddess Renenutet. She's holding the Ankh, a symbol of life. And then she's um, got the serpent head. So sometimes you'll see a, a human body with a cow head, a ram head, a hawk head. This is her with her serpent head. Inside, her name appears very clearly, starting from above, from the mouth for R, the two water signs for N, the quail, U, and two loaves of bread for the double T sound, Renenutet. The niche in the sanctuary once housed a triad statue of Amunimhat and his son, with Renenutet in the center. Many scenes in the sanctum show almost life-sized images of Amunimhat before Sobek and Renenutet. With his son behind, his son was a cobra nemes, meaning he was co-regent at the time. 350 years later, female pharaoh Hatshepsut added her mark here in one of the niches, followed by her successor, Tadmosis III. However, before Hatshepsut, the daughter of Amunimhat became pharaoh and added her mark here in the temple of her namesake. Just around the corner, hidden away, Badly damaged from rain and from sand. If I climb up here, we have the cartouche of the first ever, possible first ever female pharaoh, Sobek Neferu. We see the three Nefers and the Sobek symbol at the bottom. Sobek Neferu, the great female pharaoh that ruled on behalf of her younger brother. As a pharaoh, she was named a pharaoh. This is one of the only remnants that we have of this obscure queen. When we leave the temple and venture off, on the side streets along the Avenue of Sphinxes is where the juicy history lies. Clusters of mud brick houses that belonged to priests, farmers and workmen line the avenue on either side. The closer you lived to the temple, the more important you were. And the most important had a sphinx protecting the stairs up to their homes. Because this area was inhabited for over 4,000 years, many different styles of houses and protective sphinxes are found. From human-headed lions with Roman attributes to winged griffins, some Greek inscriptions here even mention Cleopatra sending taxes to the temple. This is thousands of years of real life, so well preserved, from pharaohs to Christians, all once called this place. I'm often asked what it is about Egypt that I love so much. And when I'm there walking through the ancient temples, seeing the writing and murals on the walls, the magic of that time and place reaches across time and space and pulls me in. And it's this magic that I want to share with others so they can feel it. And it can help them to feel more connected to the magic that's possible in their life. I hope that they feel uh joy, that they feel protection, that they feel abundance, that they uh, understand that their lives are being sculpted and changing. Of course, the serpent goddess is, is a goddess of change. Uh, she drops her skin and she grows a new one, and so we understand 
that that's what we're doing all the time. We're always changing our things different. Uh, and yet, the snake, as it drops its skin, uh, becomes a bigger snake uh, the next time around. So it grows uh, by shedding. So that's one of the mysteries of abundance is to give away of yourself to receive a greater self. A reason Renenutet was the protector of the harvest was that cobras eat rats that would destroy the grain and crops. Within the priests' homes, thousands of Ostraca texts were discovered. Written in Greek and Demotic, they reveal daily life, personal horoscopes, school registers, and corruption. A Ptolemaic priest named Fatres wrote several letters exposing how the temple was misusing offerings and that the temple college was showing signs of cult-related misconduct. A smaller building, protected by Isis, was where two large votive mummified crocodiles were stored, slotted into these shrines as a way to keep Sobek's power contained. Around them, young crocodiles were incubated and reared, with over 30 crocodile eggs found around this structure. Some texts even reveal that priests were selling inferior mummified crocodiles to pilgrims. I've been told that in here is a high official's home and it's meant to be pretty spectacular. So, oh my God. Wow. The frescoes are just, oh my God. It's so beautiful. Roman period frescoes. The history here is just so vast. You can see here the high official's house, pretty much like you get in a Roman house, Pompeii, wherever else, marked by these huge ornate columns that were carved to show the status of the person.